Hail cheaters. Welcome to the Always Cheating Podcast, second podcast of the preseason. But I feel like this is more of a proper mm. preview pod, right? We are we are officially looking into we're actually doing some work, some actual research this time. We're not <laughs> reacting as much. Yeah. We are we are proacting. I don't know. We're being proactive. That's that's what's going on in this pod. Wonderful. Yeah, like last week when the game launched, lots of reactions from diehard players. And once we get into the regular season of FPL, that's like my favorite content because it's easy to react. What did we see in the games right. that weekend? It's really hard to look forward, to cast about for the answers before we know them. Right. So this is really when the hard work yeah. begins. If it were and, easy, everyone would yeah. do it, Brandon. You know, it's, yeah. yeah, exactly. I think Kennedy talked about this, right? We want to do it because it's hard. So here we are. Um, yeah, speaking of- We should of, put a fa yeah. fantasy manager on the moon, Josh, we really, if we can. We really should. I know. I've got presidential yeah. stuff on the brain. A crazy day in America today, yeah. Brandon. A, yes. A very, uh, it's been a very dramatic summer, I have to say. Um, so we are live. I am Josh. I'm here with Brandon, Brandon Kelly. We're, we're in New York. Actually, you're, Brandon is currently in Toronto, but we are Americans. And uh, yeah, Hail Cheaters, welcome to the pod. Welcome, Brandon, to our second pod of the season. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. I'm going to see your Dulwich Hamlet kit. And yes, I think we got That's a right. few corrections on the pronunciation of Dulwich Hamlet. And mm -hmm. I'm raising you Venezia FC, freshly promoted back to Serie A. Weirdly, uh, for uh, kits, I'm wearing their last season's third kit that looks like a gondolier. Yep. They do not have a, a kit manufacturer going into this season. Oh, wow. So we'll see how that works out. You just have the, it, that's like Kappa. Is that the brand yeah, you've got it, on the yeah. front there? Yep. It's fun to see. Yeah. You don't see Kappa kits in the Premier League much these days. No. Uh, mostly in other European leagues. I'm pro Kappa. You know, Fulham had a Kappa kit oh, yeah. for, for a while. Uh, they do good stuff. When I was a kid, I thought that Kappa logo was like the raciest thing i'd ever seen in my oh, life yeah. you know it's yeah well, you would only in america only see it on like mud flaps uh on tr big big 18 wheel trucks on the freeway <laughs> right right uh and i am actually repping uh the unalways cheating t-shirt right now brandon nice. yeah Excellent. uh so we're like trader joe's brandon we wouldn't sell anything <laughs> that we wouldn't personally own ourselves so that is that's what we're doing and then i i don't think i mentioned this last time but uh i also have um every time you and i have gone to a premier league match uh we've picked up some scarves and so i've got mm -hmm. a got my little scarf collection behind me here and i i still to this day regret brendan not getting a brighton scarf i got a flag mm -hmm. which is kind of fun but i really wish i had that scarf and i know i could go online and buy it but that feels like cheating somehow to me same, it's not it? the same no sadly yeah. so what are we doing in this week's pod brandon what's the theme well, we're talking about forwards. So this this worked well for us last season. Instead of sort of like trying to muddle through team by team, yep. this is how fantasy managers think about players right. in roughly three positions. Forwards, midfielders, and defenders, and we'll include goalkeepers in that defender conversation. Right. So this in. is the... Right. First of our three previews, position by position, we'll talk about forwards today, then come in next week with midfielders and defenders and goalkeepers the following week as we get closer to the game week one deadline. So I think this is a great pool of players, like just forwards general. It's like fantasy managers bread and butter because that's where all of our, our goals are mostly just goals midfielders it's complicated because you're getting goals assists and all sorts of other bells and whistles this just feels like real meat and potatoes stuff like did you do you have any initial impressions on the pool of forward candidates for the season as you were sort of looking through yeah. uh, the assets and and the stats? Well, I, my initial impression was that there are three forwards that I'm really excited about, um, and then there's I, I find there to be a pretty significant drop off after those three. And maybe I'll just tease it right there, Brandon, and we'll get more into the forward talk uh, in a second here. But I, I did want to say. Um, we, we, we're now, what is it, four, are we four days into the season being live? Is that what it is? Roughly, launch on Wednesday? Yeah, yeah, we're yeah. like D, uh, we're, we're D-Day plus four. Yeah, D4. so I wanted to share uh, where we are right now in terms of um, ownership. Like, we're already seeing some pretty extreme, uh, we saw this, you know, a lot last season, right, where it was like almost, almost universal um, ownership for some players. And 
we're, we're not quite at that extreme yet, um, but I think we we are seeing, and I, I share with you, Brandon, I, I had a lot of fun. I'm happy to shut them out. Um, FF Stuff had a lot of fun this, this preseason digging through uh, FF Stuff's data. And uh, this is what we're looking at right now in terms of overall ownership uh, through the first four days of the season. And I think it's, it's especially, I think, useful to look at overall ownership the first four or five days of the season because you know, the kind of people who create accounts early on in the season are people who take the game maybe especially seriously, right? So right. Uh, that is a, that's a little tempered because you also have the auto pick people who literally just go like, like me until like six hours ago, which is that they, yeah. they literally just go in, create a team and then don't kind of do anything about it for two or three weeks. They just kind of go I'll in worry to worry about that, that later. Exactly. Get that low ownership number. Uh, yeah. but I think, uh, one thing we're seeing right away is that, you know, Watkins is, extremely highly owned to start the season. Uh, maybe unsurprisingly, it's very good price. I feel like at 9 million, uh, played well this summer, uh, in the, you know, in, in limited minutes for England. Um, they have a nice start to the season for, you know, Aston Villa do as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, I have to say if there was one, I'm part of the crowd here because if there was one kind of mortal lock for my squad going into game week one, it has to be Ollie Watkins, right? I mean, I, I, you, yeah. I, I know, and I know you're, you're even like a bigger fan of Watkins than <laughs> I am. I love Ollie Watkins, yeah. and it's hard uh, for me. Maybe it is because I'm an Ollie Stan that somehow his game winner that he scored to send England into the final to me was a better goal than Jude Bellingham's bicycle kick <laughs> to take that uh, that match into extra time. So I'll give Ollie credit for that. I'm not sure many people will agree, but no, just sort of not like sure I agree. there, there are there are various types of technique. You know, and and Ali exhibits the he just has all the fundamentals that he's right. put together in this exceptional athlete's body. And like his his lack of injury yeah. history, his his strength on the ball, these are all things that we love. The concerns that you have about Ali Watkins going into this season, and I'm actually kind of compelled by them, is Aston Villa in the Champions League. Right. How does that work? These are these are more matches uh, than Ali Watkins might be used to playing. He kind of had, I guess, the perfect summer for a player like Ali, where he got some meaningful minutes in a meaningful competition, but he wasn't run into the ground like yeah. maybe we think Saka yeah. might have been. So he's he's going to be sharp yeah. coming into the you preseason know, the one, for Villa. The one question I wonder about is, you know, obviously these matches are only you know, 90 minutes, maybe longer if you include, uh, you know, if they go to extra time, if it's a, you know, an elimination game or something like that. Now, clearly that's, you know, they are match minutes. So they're very intense, but is it, is it the matches themselves or is it the, like the practice, right? Like, because presumably they're kind of practicing all day, right? So even though it's like, he doesn't get that many minutes in the matches is the fact that he's just kind of training with the team. He's got a, he's not really relaxing. Is that, does that weigh on him at all? Right. Like it's like, it's like no. he didn't literally have minutes in the matches, but is that, is that where all of the intensity comes from? And it's like, I don't know. I, I think that uh, tra training at the elite level is just like so perfectly calibrated. Um, I think, you know, even, you know, depending on what your, what your niggles might even be day to day. So that doesn't worry me at all. It's like, yeah. Why would that, uh, that to me feels better than Holland or Grealish, you know, hanging out on the beach or in a casino in Las Vegas where their muscles might be a little tighter coming into training and, right. um, and may, they just haven't been thinking about the game as much. Now that, yeah. that's like a very unrealistic example, but I think you know what I mean. Yeah. There. They're, and they're all young guys. I mean, I, I, I think I basically agree with you. I mean, you just want to avoid the like Alexis Sanchez zone, right. Where you just play every single minute yeah, for your club right. and elimination minutes. And yeah, I, I think that, I think that Watkins will be fine. I mean, sort of famously too. And I, I, I'm not trying to jinx him here, but he is, you know, had an incredible injury record as well. I mean, Watkins just basically does not get injured. He's one of the healthiest players uh, in the Premier League, especially at the forward spot where you often see, I mean, Holland, uh, Gabriel Jesus kind of nonstop, uh, any number you, you pick the forward brand and I'll give you a long, and, you know, a long and gnarly injury record, uh, mm -hmm. except for, except for Watkins. Um, after that, we've got Cole Palmer, uh, in terms of overall ownership, uh, to start the season. 
Uh, I have to admit at the moment, I do not have Palmer in my squad. I am Palmerless to start the season, Brandon. Now this may change, right? I mean, we're still, again, the game's been out for four days. We're not even in August yet, but at the moment I am finding it hard to fit Palmer into my squad at 10.5 million. So you don't have him be just because you can't fit him in, not because you can make. Yeah, I'm not like keeping. Do I not? Yeah, to- I'm not keeping like seven million on my bench, or you know, or in my or in my in my bank uh, to spend mm-hmm. later. Yeah, I'm just finding it hard. I think because I do at the moment like the idea of having three expensive forwards up top, and it kind of feels mm-hmm. like you've got to either you do that or you have Palmer. And I mean, solid to me is completely out of the question. Like there's, I, I don't know how, um, you could have solid. And I guess that's because I have Holland too. Right. And so that's really the key question yeah. is, do you want Holland or don't you? And, um, we talked a little bit about it on a Wednesday, but at the moment I'm still, I'm still kind of leaning pro Holland just because, I mean, I, I, I know that you just said he was, he was off this summer. It was like, a you know, just get you putting on putting on weight, eating you know, eating uh, sandwich after sandwich, Doritos. I don't know what he yes. was eating, right? But yeah, prawn sandwiches. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but in theory, he he's been off all summer. He's ready to go. Uh, it was switching game week two, so maybe I changed my strategy after a couple of weeks. But at the moment, I do like the the Watkins um, okay. Holland uh, t- duo up front. We're going to have to talk a lot more about Cole Palmer uh, when we come back for the midfielder discussion next week because yeah. I feel like he's a must-have. Okay, uh, just like the the points that he put together last season, just like the penalties alone are terrifying. And yeah, where you have forwards where there might be some unknowns. I mean, Douglas Louise leaving Aston Villa. Yeah, how does is there a ripple effect there? Palmer, I just I just see Chelsea getting better and not worse. And there are teams like City and Villa where I wonder if it goes the other direction. Arsenal and Chelsea right now, I'm thinking of these teams are probably going to get better. Uh, so this is kind of how the framework I'm dealing with. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think I, I really want to see some preseason matches for Chelsea too, because I think that uh, Nicholas Jackson is an interesting option. Um, I think that Nkuku is probably the one that I would be most sort of intrigued by, right? If Nkuku mm-hmm. gets a chance to, I mean, and there's even a possibility that we get Nkuku as a kind of out of position player, right? Like he's been classified as a, as a midfielder this season, but I think we could possibly see him start as a forward. And if so, I think that, you know, that'd be, a, there'd be a ton of value there. I'm also, I mean, I'm a little curious about the penalty thing with Palmer. I mean, I, I, I think Palmer's great. Like, I don't, I'm not going to sit here and make some strong anti Palmer argument, but yeah. I do feel like that many penalties. I mean, I don't, I don't know how replicable that is, right? I'm not sure that that's like a, I don't know. It feels like penalties can vacillate a lot season to season, right? I feel like we've seen this with Bruno and, and Sal and stuff. So um, I don't know. I mean, like, mm-hmm. yeah, so let's let's wait. We're, we're going to do midfielders next week. So we'll we'll hold off on that at the moment. But uh, the other big forward right now is uh, Isak. He's at uh, 54% owned. Um, I think again, what you're seeing here, especially is that people are, if people are not going with Holland, it does free up a lot of cash up front to spend. And sort of at that point, it kind of makes sense. I think logically to go with, with Isak and Watkins as your, as your front two, right? Uh, just mm-hmm. because uh, and, and Isak plays, is it Southampton in game week one? Um, it's, a uh, yeah, Newcastle house, Southampton at home in game week one. So fantastic start. If you, don't have Holland and you were looking for a really strong, I mean, also, you know, Holland plays uh, a way to Chelsea in game week one as well. So um, you could make an argument that, um, that someone like Isak is even better captaincy pick, right. For game week one. So um, I think that there's, Mm -hmm. there's, you know, I think that Isak, I mean, how are you feeling about Isak right now? I, I know I'm sort of giving away our, I know I'm sort of giving away our forward talk, but uh, how are you you feeling good about Isak? Like uh, any, any doubts? I feel great. So, so going back to the Watkins thing is I give Isak the edge over Watkins right now, just because there's something about Isak where he feels more like the finished product as far as fantasy assets go. I love Ollie Watkins, but, um, I don't know. It's just the, the the finishing ability that Isak has over virtually everyone else in the Premier League. And uh, it's sort of, sort of a reverse of Newcastle going into the Europa League. They will not be playing full-strength lineups the way Aston Villa will 
midweek. So Isak is going to be probably playing fewer minutes heading wow. into every FPL game week. So are you uh, making, so I'm making a case for maybe not having Palmer. Are you making a case for not having Watkins going into the season? That's what it sounds like. Uh, yeah, I think what it's going to end up for me. Well, the way I'm thinking right now is Holland, Isak and uh, bargain guy, okay. uh, bargain third striker, like a Joe Pedro, wow. perhaps. Yeah. Um, you, this is, and you're the same guy, by the way, who said, your only regret last season was not having Watkins for all 38 weeks, right? So, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Just clarifying. So, just getting that yeah, on that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the, these are the stances that everybody has to has to take at this part of the preseason. You know? Yeah. Controversy creates conversation, Josh. And that's what, <laughs> that's, I, okay. that's what I'm that's all true. about. That's true. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, let's, uh, you know, we are going to talk forwards. Uh, obviously, have you started to look at your team at all? Have you started to, uh, you know, mock anything up or, or put together yeah, a draft? I, I put a draft together and what's remarkable about it is I have no Liverpool players. Uh, actually, I do have one Liverpool player, 4.0 midfielder, um, Bacicic, uh Stefan Bacicic, uh, Okay, that guy, 4.5. Yeah. Um, so obviously we're we're going to talk a little bit about fixture difficulty in a moment. Liverpool yeah. have an incredible start to the season. So this is worrying to me. And I don't feel like I have my Arsenal strategy fully down yet. You know, so I'm I'm looking at Odegaard right now as a bargain. Like now now is the point in the tinkering with your team where you can more easily justify, oh, I'm just going to Fuck the trend and I'm going to have Odegaard over Saka. Yeah. Or I'm not going to have double Arsenal defense because I like how I can construct my team right now. This team is very sort of blue sky. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm a little worried about my approach to Liverpool and Arsenal uh, mostly. I put together a team in about, you know, a minute and a half uh, over the weekend. Uh, sort of looked at it a little bit last night, tinker with it again today. Uh, but it's not really anything serious yet because I, they're, we're going to see a lot of transfers. We're going to see uh, some preseason matches. I mean, they're, they're just questions, I think, that kind of abound, right? Like someone like Zhao Pedro, is he... Actually, like his ownership keeps creeping higher and higher, I've noticed. And I'm not quite convinced yet, right? Because he has not really been a reliable starter for Brighton. Now, of course, they're under a new manager, but I, I don't know why that kind of automatically makes him a starter, right? Under under a new manager. Well, the, the argument there is Deserby is like a legend uh, in ro- in the rotation game. Yeah. Like Deserby's favorite thing to do is rotate players. Right. And he would also put Joe Pedro in weird Spots on the pitch, you never knew was, if he was going to be central or a little wider, but certainly I, the way Deserby played that, it was dependent on sort of the game state. But I think a new manager <laughs> feels like it, it's probably going to benefit Joe Pedro as a fantasy asset. I think you'd be hard pressed to find a manager that rotates as much as Deserby, especially yeah. at a club like Brighton. So, and and I think the minutes that Pedro, Joe Pedro got were good enough. Yeah. For me, if he gets more consistent starts, he's probably the best value, uh, I, I think, for a cheap forward because yeah. he does have penalties in his arsenal. Yeah. Uh, I, I, and, and Ferguson is out until early October, right? And so if he's out that long, then um, uh, then we're not really talking about him necessarily coming back days later, right? We're, sure. we're talking about some sub-appearances and things like that. So you can probably safely have Pedro. Uh, so again, this is why I'm saying I, it's, I'm not down on him. I just, I want to see, um, I just want to yeah. see some Brighton lineups, right? We have a bunch of new men. I mean, I'm in the same spot as you. I don't have any Liverpool players in my squad at the moment either, but part of it is it's, I, I find it very hard to decide what to do, right? As someone like Darwin, uh, 11 goals, 11 assists last season, but, uh, was basically a bench player by the end of the season, right? It was not trusted to start any longer. Uh, Cody Gakpo looks fantastic over the summer, but, is about to get, you know, he's, he's in the midst of several weeks off ahead of the season. So does he yeah. jump right into the squad? You know, just a lot of questions uh, with a lot of the new managers. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when I was putting together a squad, it, it was basically, uh, the question I was trying to ask myself is whether I could put together a squad that had Watkins, Holland and Isak up front and whether that would, um, whether that would make sense, like whether that, like, cause that's a lot of money, right? Holland alone is 15 million. Isak's 8.5. Watkins is nine. Right. So, but the, you know, but those three forwards are taking up almost a third of my cash, right? That I have available to spend on fifteen players, um, right? So three players are taking up 
thirty percent. Um, and so, mm-hmm. uh, and so that that I just makes me it makes my midfield super weak, right? And so I don't actually think it's workable long term. And I think Isak probably has to go at some point. Uh, probably makes way for. Um, you know, basically, I'll probably find a way to bring in Anthony Gordon at seven point five million as a as a forward, just to yeah. have some, some Newcastle asset, and then and then find you know someone else um, that I can slot in. Uh, you know, I like Eze at the moment at seven million. I think he makes a lot of sense. Um, and uh, I didn't know, by the way, that Mateta is uh, playing for the French Olympic team. Did mm-hmm. you did you see this? Not only is he playing yeah. for, the, for the French Olympic team, but Lacazette, Alexander Lacazette, our boy, yeah. is the captain of this Olympic yeah. team. I, I actually watched some highlights on YouTube last night of their last game. I don't remember who they were playing. And um, Michael Elise ended up scoring the game-winning goal for them. Lacazette missed so many chances. <laughs> he looked like he had a very poor game. Yeah. Came off with a very sad look on his face around the 70th minute. Yeah. Uh, Mateta looked good. He was he was definitely a presence up front like we were yep. used to seeing at Palace. So um, there's some real ballers on that U23 team. Yeah. And my midfield right now, and this is the team that I mocked up, I've got Nkuku, Garnacho, Odegaard, Eze. I mean, I probably have two trustworthy players out of four, right? And that and that's mm-hmm. why it's just it's just not gonna work, I don't think. Um uh, but it's fun just to tinker during this, you know, during the early season. And you know, Gavardial, I feel like is another player that I Again, he, you know, he did play in Europe, although Serbia didn't make it into the um or not not Serbia. Um yeah, Serbia? Is Gavardial? No, he's um he's Croatian. Yeah, yeah Cro- he, uh, Croatia. Excuse me, of course. Yeah, although Croatia didn't make it either, uh, out of, you know, into the round of sixteen. So he yeah. doesn't have too much tread on his tires. I think he'll be back by the start of the season. He's not traveling to the U.S. for their um, for their tournament, which actually, as a reminder, I'm going to be at this this upcoming Saturday, Brandon. So it's going to be a little scouting in person. Scouting person. If you're going to be there, let me know. I'll be there with my with my seven year old. Uh, but uh, Gavardial, Gabriel, and uh, Dan Byrne are my starting three. I think that's a pretty template-ish starting three. I know some people have uh, Saliba in their squad, and uh, but yeah. with, with Saliba and Gabriel at the same price, I think it just makes sense to go with Gabriel because I just think he's got more goal threat um, in the box, and um, and I'll t- I'll take a little goal threat whatever, maybe, um, a little bit of a bonus point, uh, even the bonus points, I think are pretty marginal, right? Cause if you expect more goal threat, yeah. you should get more bonus, you know, from that as well. Totally. Yeah. Uh, I, I think my differences here are Watkins is Jao Pedro. And then I don't have in Cuckoo Garnacho as a, I've made room there for Anthony Gordon mm-hmm. and, uh, who else would it be in the midfield? Oh, uh, Palmer. Palmer. Right, right. So right. I wa- I wonder if the decision is going to be if you go with Holland, you're going to have to pick one of three between Saka, Palmer, and Salah. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there are ways to get two of those three maybe, and yeah. but it just feels like you're going to bring in some real scrubs. I'm almost scared. to Once I put together a team without Holland in it, it's going to be really hard to go back to a team with Holland in it, right? Because once you, like, let's say in your squad, right? Let's say you move um, Ali Watkins or, or you move Holland to Watkins, right? You free up six mm-hmm. million. Like yeah. that, that is so much. That, yeah. that like, Basically, that'll turn, that turns like Eze into Mo Salah, right? It's like, it's a gigantic yeah. difference. In tr- I mean, Eze is, a, you know, an excellent fantasy asset, I think, this season, right? But it just shows you... Or, or you could upgrade five other spots, right? It's like it's sort of everywhere, uh, the money just can be spread around in so many different ways. And so, uh, I, I kind of wonder if I'm ultimately going to end up without Holland. It's just, it's just hard to say because I think if you go without Holland, um, the one thing it, it creates is a, a situation where every single week you're sweating the captaincy. And, and part of the appeal of Holland is that he's such an incredibly consistent player that you can basically just captain him every single week, right? As long as he's healthy, there's tremendous goal threat there, good right. opportunity for a very high ceiling return. Uh, you know, if he, the, you know, Ipswich, I, I don't think you should ever build an entire strategy around one fixture, but that Ipswich home fixture in game week two does kind of loom for me as a match where I could just see a really massive return from Holland. Right. And so that's, that's, that's part of the appeal, I think for him there. Yeah, this, that's the big one. Holland. <laughs> it's like you're, it, one, one of two things is going to happen. You're going to be panicking in game week two because you don't have him or you're going to feel very smug because you do. Yeah. Or a third option where you're going to feel like an idiot because you do have him. Do you ever and, feel – you actually – you strike me as somebody who does feel smug from time oh, to time. Sure, I, all the time. I, I rarely – I don't know that I've ever felt smug in my life, to be totally yeah. honest. I think that's that's like – 
I, I don't know. It, I don't feel it, like once I feel smug, there's some part of my brain that's like, oh man, like maybe it's cause I was raised Catholic or something. But I'm yeah. like the second I, there's like a feeling of smugness. My brain is like, oh, you're yeah. heading for a big time fall, buddy. Let's talk about this to what's the hardest thing to do. If so, if Holland, depending on what happens with Holland in game weeks one or two, yeah. is, is it harder to get Holland in or is it harder to get Holland out? I wonder if it's harder to get Holland out of your team because I think the reason you'd get Holland out of your team is because he's blocking you from getting yeah. three or four other it, guys who might be yeah. getting, and you need the the that to be able to sort of grab that variance in, yeah. in the midfield with the budget you're missing because you have Holland. I think it so depends it, on how you yeah. how you spread the money around, right? If you if you turn Holland into five different options, then then obviously that's it's hard. If you turn Holland into Sala, right. Then, then I think it's a little bit easier, right. You can basically get there in two moves. Um, so I, I think that that's really what it comes down to, right. Is whether you, um, basically whether you want to go for another, like kind of massive player or cause even, even Palmer doesn't quite get you there, right. Like to get from Watkins to Holland, you have to turn Palmer into like a 4.5 million midfielder, right. So it doesn't really, work like you yeah. know i mean it's, it's kind of only sala that it really would make sense or for that to be a, like a fairly straightforward move right i mean if you yeah. have five transfers to do it then then that's <laughs> yeah, fine that's you know? the yeah. thing yeah yeah you kind of yeah. have to ride out the holland narrative for the first five weeks and then <laughs> right. then you'll be fine <laughs> yeah when do you think you'll make your first transfer do you think it'll be game week six or do you think that you'll uh <laughs> <laughs> oh it'll uh, game week three Maybe. Game week three. Yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, all right. Well, let's get into. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing this team because I don't want. I don't want too much criticism because that team is not. Um, I you know I don't. Um, I I don't like sharing my team too much this early on in the season, right? Because I I find myself. I, I know sometimes like people like like will share their team on Twitter or on our Discord or whatever, and I feel like there's like a part of like there's like it's like people get into like a defensive crouch like right away. Like the second you share it, you start to like. It's like some people just like the, the, they can like put it out into the world and it's like, yeah. there it is. Right. But other people are like, I have to defend every single thing that I've done. Right. <laughs> and I, you know, and I'm not ready to do that. I like maybe by, you know, by the time we do our game week one preview pod, I feel like I, I should be ready to talk and, and be serious. But I think until then it's just, it's just kind of a mess. This sort of how I feel. My oh, so we're, we're all, you know, even though we're the ones hosting the podcast, we're all in early learning. Uh, yeah. here. And I think we're just like, it's, it's all theoretical. We need to like all science, Josh, we need to actually get into the laboratory and start running yeah. some experiments. And basically that yeah. is what you're going to be doing, uh, at the man city AC Milan match for any of us watching, you know, highlights on YouTube, seeing what the formations are, who's working well, uh, in, in those formations, et cetera. All right. Well, let's get into some proper pod stuff now, Brandon. Nice long 33 minute uh, start to this week's uh, episode. Uh, Patreon is up and running. Uh, if you want to support the podcast, uh, that we get an, you get an extra podcast each week and go to patreon.com slash always cheating. Just since we last did our pod, Brandon, we got some new patrons and thank you to Rom Frosk, new producer Rom Frosk and James Watts. Hello, James. And hey, James. Ryan. Yeah. And I assume Ron Frosk is, is, uh, it's just one, like, I think that's that person's, uh, it's just one name. It's like Madonna, just one simple <laughs> first name. Maybe it, it could be Ron Frosk, Ron Frosk, like just like that name twice. Right. But yeah, I, I yeah. think Ron, Ron Frosk has been around the Patreon community for a while. I think I always think of the band Romstein. I do I too. See his yeah, name, yeah, so. yeah. Welcome yeah. I back. know. I know he's a returning. It's a nice yeah. to have him back, though. Thanks. Welcome thanks back. for thanks for coming back. So, if you support the podcast on Patreon, you get an extra podcast each week. New as of this season, ad free podcast feed. So yes. I know some people have been clamoring for that. Uh, we finally did it, and uh, part of the appeal of that as well is that means we can drop um, all of the pods. It's, it's just one feed. So if you're a Patreon supporter, you get the Patreon pod and our other pod uh, all in one feed. It makes it uh, quite a lot easier for patrons. And and, uh, yeah. you know, it's, uh, I'm a second captain's world service podcast member as are you, Brandon. And it's very nice just to get the, the one simple feed for everything. So yep. I think that'll make things easier for people. 
Uh, you also have, we have a ton of mini leagues, mini leagues for our Patreon support has been a lot of, uh, mini leagues that other people have started, uh, international mini leagues. Uh, there, I, I hope our friend Shiv is doing this again, Brandon, where it's beat the average mini league. Yes. And it's, you, yes. Yeah. Maybe it was Eric, one, one of our, one of our Patreon supporters. <laughs> and basically Eric, yeah. you have to, it was Eric, uh, you basically just have to finish better than average. And every week, if you finish better than average, you get to stay in the mini yeah. league. It was shocking what a bloodbath this was. It is. Yeah. <laughs> you think it would be quite easy. It's like one of these suicide leagues where it's like, oh, all you have to do is pick a team, you know, not to lose. Like, how hard could that be? And it's like every yeah. week, it's like thir- third of the people are gone. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that's b- bubbling up too on the Discord is our first ever community team. And our friend Francis is going to get that off the ground. But that's going to be fun. Get, re- get every- yeah. everybody on the Patreon an opportunity to actually run the always cheating uh, community team. We'll see if that can beat the average too. So yeah, like tons of leagues bubbling up uh, small and large. And this is always my favorite time of the season for, for that stuff to be like, Oh yeah. Yeah. Remind me of the rules there. Every league has its own little special rule that I have to remember. Yeah, and we do lots of kit giveaway contests during the season as well, including then this one that I've got behind me here. So, um, yeah, Brandon, and then we're also very excited to partner with the Fantasy Football Hub again this season. Uh, we had a great call with Holly, the famous Holly, Brandon, a couple of days ago. It was very exciting. It's fun to be part of that community. And uh, they have a bunch of great features this season. I think the win your mini league or get your money back feature is pretty yeah, cool. That's awesome. I feel like that's that's something I would... Um, you know, I, I, I'm, we're in, a, we're in some pretty competitive mini leagues, Brandon. So I yeah. think, uh, if I legally were able to do that, I would be, uh, <laughs> I'd be ready to go. That'd be an incentive enough for me, uh, to join. Uh, you can also get your team rated by AI, Brandon, perhaps you've seen, um, the movie AI with Will Smith. Um, it's, I've uh, seen, I've seen Simone starring Al Pacino. Yeah. Is it anything like Simone? You can pick, you can pick the evil alien from, from AI, or you can okay. pick Simone to rate your team. So you have two options, which is great. Uh, they're both huge FPL players and fans. Fantastic. Uh, so yeah, and they'll, despite being, well, I don't know, is Simone evil? The AI from AI definitely is. I but, think she's uh, evil yeah. in that she, you know, she uses her powers of seduction uh, maybe to, right. to to make men do things that they, they wouldn't normally right. do. Is that bad or good? Who's to say? I, you know, I, I can't go with you. You're, you're misanthropy here, Brandon, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the, uh, expert, expert team reveals and advice. You can see the game week one squad yeah. of some of the all time best fantasy players. It's really useful. Right. And I, I don't think, yeah. I, I think honestly, it's just, it, it spurs ideas. I think that most people, yeah. there's idea that people are just going to blindly copy, but for me, that's not how I play. That's not how I want to play, but I do like looking at other people's squads because it, I, I want to know what the smart people are thinking because it spurs ideas for my own team. It doesn't, totally. it doesn't make me doubt myself. It just, it just gives me more yeah. ideas, uh, you know, to, to put together my own squad. Yeah. And I was, I've been thinking about the, cause we ran the same promotion last year, the win your mini league or get your money back from the hub. Is it a gimmick? And I, I it's like, it's distinctly not a gimmick because just becoming a member of a site like this just makes you that much more motivated it makes you that much more engaged we hear this from listeners of always cheating all the time of like hey yep. i've been a kind of a casual player of the game and i it's my first season listening to your pod and i had my best finish ever because of that and it just means hey you made a conscious decision to be a little bit more engaged with your team so if this is the season where you think I'm going to beat my buddies, I'm going to beat my coworkers, yep. I think it's worth giving it a shot. So you have 50% off at fantasyfootballhub.co.uk slash always at any, yep. any tier that you want to grab there. It's 50% off with that code slash right. always. Yeah, and we'll put that in the show notes as well, so you can just click a button uh, just in order click. To, to take advantage. Just, just click. Um, and uh, we are, our Super League is also live, uh, so you can get that. I'm not going to read off the code because I can't imagine anyone's actually writing this thing down. But if you go to uh, alwayscheating.com, you can get access to the um, Always Cheating. There's a big button right at the top. Just click that button, and you're good to go. Um, all right, Brian, should we get into our proper yeah, forward talk here? Yeah. All right. I put together and I will, I will share this. Uh, I put together a little database and, and again, uh, it's, it's all, um, I, I cheerfully taken. Brandon from, Mm -hmm. um, from FF stuff. Uh, I want to give them uh, full credit. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, but I just sort of sorted it and organized it in a way that I thought made sense. And so I will, um, what I'll do is I'll drop this into our discord, 
uh, and anybody who wants to um, take a look at this or use this as a reference tool um, is free. So if you become a Patreon supporter, then you can um, take advantage of that. Of course, you can just get it yourself. But uh, just if you want the kind of cleaned up, you know, if you really like everything in Calibri font, Brandon, then you're then you're really uh, going to be happy with. I see you. You're at you're at font size thirteen here. That's a little too big, honestly. Come on. Well, I, yeah, I was, I, I knew I was going to be sharing it on the pod. And so I was like, I better go up on this. <laughs> okay. I, okay. I think normally, normally I'd be working in like an 11, you know, but Absolutely. I was like, all right, let's do it. The elegant way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, uh, I was like, I'll, I'll do it this way. But, uh, what's nice is, uh, you've got the, uh, you know, I've got it sort of by forwards here, obviously, although all the players, um, are, are on this, um, chart as well. Uh, but you can kind of see, you got the, uh, 2024, 2025 data, and then, um, all of last season's information as well. And so the way that, uh, we're going to talk about forwards on this on this pod is uh, we're going to talk about them in terms of tiers. So basically, um, how much are they going to make you um, cry this season, Brandon? It's going to be it's a tier system. So uh, weeping is the, the the weeping tier is the final tier, Brandon. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> no, it's uh, we're starting <laughs> we're starting with um, that was like an incredible dad joke that I just uh, pulled off there. I'm sorry, you know, I'm just I'm around a seven year old too much, Brandon. And this is really what I totally what I totally blanked out while you were talking there. So I, it's, <laughs> No harm, no foul. <laughs> um, so we have uh, different tiers, though. Uh, basically, we've got um, uh, well, we'll start off with 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 tier one, Brandon. Okay, and this is an idea that um, you see this a lot when you look. I don't know if you're, you're I don't you don't strike me as the kind of guy who reads things like NBA draft previews. No. I don't. I, I can't imagine you're looking at John Hollinger's uh, NBA draft. Never data, heard of but, him. Right. Fair enough. Uh, well, uh, there's. Often when they look at uh, draft prospects for the season, they group things into tiers, right? And so you have kind of future, you know, future superstar is kind of like the top tier, right? And sometimes, sometimes there's literally zero players that are in that top tier, right? And then you've got a potential all-star right is tier two usually there's a handful of players that, that that are there and then it's kind of like reliable starters is is the third tier and, and on and on from there right and so that's i think a little bit how we can think about forwards going into this season as well is um you know who are kind of the best and then who's going to fill out our squad yeah. uh you know you only you only have three spots and so i think and and, and everyone's going to be a little bit different in terms of their team structure as well um you and i have both tended to play with three forwards, although um, neither of us are married to it. Um, I find that playing with three tends to be it just, it tends to be what I want to do. Like I want to start three forwards. I, and, you know, I, I think the, the rationale is, is pretty simple, possibly dumb, but my th- the rationale is basically like they score goals and mm-hmm. goals are one of the most important things that you get in yeah. fantasy. And uh, so, you know, and especially nowadays where you have these sort of versatile, Kai Havertz style forwards, right? Who are who are able to score and and right. set up uh, other players for assists as well. I mean, uh, you know, I think that I think we just have a lot of very versatile forwards. I mean, uh, Ollie Watkins is a great example of this too, right? A player who's um, just as happy to uh, assist as he is to score. And um, yeah. now that he's kind of put it all together, he's turned into one of the best fantasy players in the in the game, right? So, yeah. um, so basically, we have uh, the 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 tier one are um, elite forwards, Brandon, and that is uh, two players, uh, Erlen Holland at 15 million and Ali Watkins at 9 million. Uh, Holland is, um, uh, you, you know, 27 goals, eight assists, uh, last season, uh, a slight step down from the season before. Although, um, part of that is that he missed, what was it like roughly two months or so with, with injury last season? January, yeah. When you, when you put it in context, it still is sta- almost as staggering as his first season with man city. You're like this yeah. guy by all accounts had a downbeat season. He right. missed a number of games through injury and here he is with 27 goals. It's yeah. incredible his efficiency. And I think the, the problem from a fantasy point of view is there were just the stretches were too long where he was not producing. Like there, right. you, he gets to 27 goals because he has a handful of games where he's scoring a brace or a hat trick or even four goals. And that really gets you through. But what that means is you're kind of suffering through some stretches of the season. And now that he's 15 million, people's patience for suffering like that is going to be slim to none. To yeah. what people won't even Yeah, have. it was already hard last year, right? Yeah. And now right. it's, yeah, it's going to be even harder at 15 yeah. And the temptation to captain him, not the temptation, but almost the necessity to captain him, yeah. makes that even more painful when he gets 
you know, he he gets nicked by uh, a cheaper forward, be it Isaac yeah. Isak or Watkins. So uh, yeah. that's that's the concern here. This podcast is supported by IP Vanish VPN. If you care about the security of your online activity, the easiest way to protect yourself is with IP Vanish. Rated excellent on Trustpilot, IP Vanish provides an encrypted connection for all of your internet traffic, helping to prevent websites, Wi Fi providers, and hackers from intercepting your data. Help keep your financial details, personal information, and online activity safe from threats with IP Vanish. Get started with this limited time offer and save 83% on our two year subscription. Visit ipvanish.com slash cheating. Again, that's ipvanish.com slash cheating. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Yeah, and I, I it's, it's amazing. I'm sort of talking myself out of Holland as we go through this pod already. Uh, you know, we're, we're sort of, we're, we're learning as we go uh, early on in the season here as well, Brent. I mean, you know, you and I both just had the prices for, for five days now. And so it's yeah. sort of, it takes a little while to process uh, how the prices, and that's actually why it's useful to, to start setting up some drafts. It's it's one thing to sort of think about players, but until you start to actually try to fit them all into your squad, it it you know, it really does change your perspective a little bit. And I think it's interesting to compare. And so the other, you know, so we have Holland and then we have Watkins as the other player. And I think it's, when you look at what they did last season, um, Watkins, eight fewer goals than Holland, but 10 more assists in the season outscored him by 11 points in terms of total fantasy points, again, healthier, but, but still, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, fantastic return. Uh, even if you look at the points per game average, it's not significantly lower than Holland. That's, that's a column E uh, I here, Brandon. If you're if you're following along yeah. on my little chart, uh, so six point two points per game average. Yeah, you know, a little a little short, but again, why exactly is he six million cheaper than <laughs> Holland? It feels like either Holland should be less or Watkins should be more. I, I, Watkins at nine million yeah. is starting to feel to me like 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 he might just be priced too low. Honestly, given I, I don't know what. How much of a downturn can we expect from him this this season, right? I mean, it, yeah. he played. It felt like he scored every eight minutes. He was on the pitch for. I mean, he was you know he's, he was terrific in the uh, in in the, the Euros when he actually you know played and got minutes. And so, yeah. I don't know. It's uh, so I, what yeah. what what the the pricers of these players are suggesting. I think by this by him being six million cheaper than Holland is there's yep. going to be a regression from Watkins. That's the right. suggestion, or it's it, it's just like. The likeliest outcome is that Watkins yeah. is not going to have as good a fantasy season right. this season. So you don't want to totally price him out so that nobody gets him and, you, and nobody has or ever has him throughout the course of the season. Uh, yeah. But you don't want to, of course, price him too cheap. So if he has the same season as he did last season at $9 million, he'll be at eleven five next season for, for a guess. Yeah. And so I, I just think when you when you start to look at that, I mean, even even in terms of bonus, he and Holland were, were tied on bonus points for the season. So I, I think I really think that if you're um, I think you can really make a case for for just sort of seeing Watkins as a kind of as a very similar asset to Holland. I mean, I, the, I mean, I, even in terms of ceiling, I mean, how much 
How much higher is, is Holland's ceiling than Watkins? I mean, Watkins had some absolutely spectacular matches last season too. So yeah. uh, again, I, I go back to the, the Douglas Louise. Uh, he's just completed his transfer to AC Milan. How much yeah. uh, does that whole thing start to get shaky? Because you know, Douglas Louise is more of a ball carrying or sure. defensive or midfield destroyer sort. Yeah. <sighs> it's, you take those it's players worry. out, and it's yeah. it's a bit of a worry. He could be certainly be replaced by by a, as good or or better player, uh, but then you've got John McGinn, who's also a mainstay in the midfield, who's getting older, and what kind of output can we suggest? Can we expect? It's kind of I think it's just going to be a transitional moment for Villa. They will have a war chest going into the Champions League, so like. I will certainly be proved wrong. I think they will strengthen with the Douglas Louise money and whatever they're going to yeah, spend for there. But it's, it, it, yeah. how long is that going to take to get that right? It might not be at the start of the season. It in the in terms of buys that they've done so far in the offseason, I think the the one that they've you know, the biggest one they've made so far is uh, Ian Matson, who moved over from Chelsea. Yeah. Uh, it's a massive deal, uh, a little more than I was expecting uh, for Matson. He, he signed for it was a forty million deal, so uh, presumably he's going to be um, the the left back. It's been a little unsteady, right? The the left back spot. Um, that, I mean, Dean has has played well, but um, feels like they've never totally like. Yeah, Moreno of, is yeah. is like could be better than Dean, but he's kind of weird. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, and it feels like they've just never totally found a comfort level with any of the left backs. Yeah. And so, yeah. so I, I don't know if that that doesn't necessarily do anything for the kind of Diaz question. But you know, if there's another, another talented kind of ball carrier up the left, that that could help Watkins. And Watkins sort of traditionally does play. I think of him as a sort of left. He leans left, Brandon. Mm. You know, uh, mm-hmm. I'm not talking about his politics here, but he, uh, <laughs> you know, but he. I mean, I think he did even when he was uh, with Brentford, right? Didn't he sort of play as uh, on the left wing I, at Brentford? I, I, I'd be. I believe talking. he did yeah. when he played with Tony. Um, so yeah, I don't think so he I, ever played with Tony though. Or t- Tony, they were never together at I Brentford. I think Tony came into Brentford after Watkins left. Okay, we're gonna have to look this up. That's okay. usually. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong about this. I, I hate to I hate to be wrong, Brandon, and I, I rarely am. But maybe it's possible you're right here. All right. So we know we know a lot about those two guys, right? And so we don't need to go too much into the the Holland Watkins thing. I think I think the players beyond that are where you start to get into some interesting debates, some interesting questions. And so we've got tier two, Brandon. I guess this is again, if I'm using my NBA system, these are um, potential all stars. Right, they're mm-hmm. um, I, we're, these, you know, these are not Hall of Famers, right? They're but they're they're all stars. This is your um, oh, let's think about your Paul Georges, Brandon. Great. Your um, you know, yeah, the twenty five points per game kind of guys. <laughs> all right, uh, so we've got uh, let's start things off with with Isak, uh, eight point five million. Another player who came in at a terrific price, um, twenty one goals, four assists last season. Callum Wilson apparently just got injured again. Uh, this was um, I was reading. I was actually uh, I read this in an Everton newspaper last evening, Brandon. That tells you how deep I was digging. The reason this is an Everton <laughs> newspaper because, at the local coffee shop. <laughs> no, it was online. It was I guess it was a digital newspaper. But they were they were talking about it because uh, Newcastle had been rumored at times to be looking at Dominic or um, at Dominic Calvert Lewin uh, mm. as a potential kind of backup forward option, and so. Now Everton is worried again that I'm kind of like, well, if you can, if you can sell high on Calvert Lewin, that's like a yeah, oh yeah, a, that, Everton a will be getting I mean, away with murder there. Yeah, they, I mean, DCL we all like Calvert Lewin, but horrible season last season. He's had like and it five wasn't. horrible seasons. He's like, he can't stay healthy. It's like I mean, I like him as a even when like he a, was healthy, yeah. he was healthy for a good stretch last season and could not score yeah. a goal. I know the, it's, it's 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 maybe he needs a change of scenery. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, but Isak is. Not only is Isak a, a terrific goal scorer, as you mentioned, you know, great finisher. Uh, he's on pens. Uh, he is also a super fun player, right? Like if, if part of the ethos of the Always Shooting podcast is make fantasy fun again, right? Mm-hmm. Like make sure that you're having a good time while you're playing fantasy. I think that Isak fits the bill. There's just something about his style. Like he's so lanky and like he just... He's in the box, you know, I don't know. I just, I don't know. Like they're saying about the way he runs. He's a great passer too. I, I just really enjoy, like, you know, he can, he can run with the ball. Um, it's just like when you're watching a Newcastle match, Isak is, he's like, you, you, you like, he, you know, he's not like, um, 
uh, who's like a good, like Chris Wood, for example, right? He's no Chris Wood. <laughs> like there's a lot of, yeah. a lot of dynamism in Isak's game. Do you, do you agree with me on that? Yeah, I do. He's got, his gait is really impressive. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, I'm, I, sometimes I'm worried about players who have a slighter build. Um, right. but I just think how Isak uses his body is so impressive. It's almost more impressive than how Holland uses his strength. Cause that's just sort of, sort of obvious. Of course, Holland yeah. has that frame. That's how he's going to use it. Isak, I just kind of, you, you kind of don't exactly know what movement he's going to make next. And it's usually really crafty or smart. And he's really good at just like working the space and, like you, like we're saying, that finishing is is with Kane out of the league. Yep, Isaac might be the best, fi- like just straight up finisher of the ball we have right now. And again, they have a great game week one match, right? Home to Southampton in game week one. So if you put together a team and you don't have Holland in your squad, and you're like sort of anxious about who your captaincy is going to be for game week one, I think that Isak is an excellent captain shot for game week one. Uh, I think is. You know, sometimes you can just think about these players in terms of their kind of floor and their ceiling. And I just feel like the floor for Isak in a home match, game week one, Mm -hmm. you know, incredible stadium, great fans. Um, I just, it's hard for me to imagine him going without a return in that match, right? Like, it just feels like his floor is an assist, right? Maybe it's a goal. Like, it just, it's very hard to me for me to imagine him not getting anything from that. So that's, that's another thing I think to recommend him, you know, for early on in the season. Yeah, I feel like he <clears throat> he wants to be the talisman of that team. I think there are a lot of great players yeah. at Newcastle right now who just kind of struggled for fitness last season. But Isak just kind of stands apart from even somebody like Gordon, where it's he he would say it's my team, and I yep. love that. Yeah, yeah, and and yeah, again, again, he's he's just a fun player, and the price is good too. I mean, eight point five million is a fairly easy. I think mm-hmm. in general, the forward prices are all very reasonable. It's it's very easy. I mean, they really have challenged you, right? It's do you, and, it, and I think, I, again, I just think the pricing was very good uh, this season in, in FPL. And it's it's basically, do you want Holland or do you want a bunch of reasonably priced forwards, right? Because you, you can <laughs> yeah. sort of get a lot of really good players for for an affordable price and you can kind of double down, you know, in your midfield. So I think yeah. it's, I think it's a, it's a great challenge and I think it should lead to a lot of variety in terms of all you had to do was price Holland at 15 million to, to get this right. Yeah. Because I, there's some people who won't be able to resist po- possibly self-included, right. Having, having Holland. Uh, but if you don't, then it really opens up a lot of variety. You know, someone yeah. like Trent Alexander Arnold, who's, who's impossible, right. With in a Holland squad, maybe starts to make sense. Yeah. So um, all right, what let's I, move on. Yeah, oh, yeah, sorry, I, 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 I'm going to take you there uh, mm-hmm. to Solanke, who I just can't figure out what I think about him now. I feel last season I finally came around to I want this guy as frequently as makes sense in my fantasy mm-hmm. team. Yep. I think he probably had his, had his best season in the league last season. 7.5 for a Bournemouth team that like, has a good manager – uh, you could talk about him in the same way that we might talk about Mateta in that is the Areola regime at Bournemouth going to take Bournemouth any farther than where they were last season. And right. with Crystal Palace and Mateta, can Glasner keep that momentum going? Like, which is more likely to you that Palace keeps going in that positive direction or that Bournemouth finds another level? Well, Bournemouth are probably going to be a more stable squad year to year than, than Palace. I think the loss of Michael Elise is going to be big for them. Um, although they also have some young players that are really coming on. So I, I think it's, I don't know. I think it's an interesting question. I think, I think there's more, I think there's more change. And also like, I mean, Palace have just a lot of their players have struggled for health right over the last mm-hmm. few seasons. And so I would say that Bournemouth feel like the more stable of the two squads, which probably works in Solanke's favor. Yep. He also has a slightly better track record, right? I mean, he's been kind of in and out of the premier league for several seasons. Um, really was, didn't really, 
have any appeal as a fantasy asset until Bournemouth came back up, yeah. right? And then, uh, but the, the last two years, um, he's been fantastic. And obviously last season, yeah. almost scored, you know, 19 goals, three. I'm actually surprised those assist numbers aren't higher because I, I, I consider him to be a pretty good passer of the ball mm, as well. He's, surra- yeah. he's, he's not surrounded by, uh, there's no <laughs> reason true. for me to take yeah. shots at Bournemouth. Bless them. Yeah. yeah. But, um, for I was uh, curious, so I went hunting around for deep details of yeah. Solanke's contract at Bournemouth, which runs through 2027. So he's got like two years left, or a, a little more than two years. Uh, yeah. But he has a buyout clause of 65 million, and I, I, I don't see him leaving Bournemouth before the start of this season. Right. And if that's the case, he would want to build on last season to get the move of his dreams uh, going into next summer. So Mm -hmm. I feel like given the state of his form and fitness and the contract, it's kind of shaping up for him to have another great season is my feeling. Interesting. Yeah. A possible Holland replacement for you, Brandon. Is that where you're, is that where you're (laughs) leaning? He's on pens. That's all I need to know. Is he on pens? You want 11 11 pen takers. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you can find three uh, in the the defense as well. And then again, yeah, Ederson, you know, who knows? Maybe it's his year. I mean, 19 Uh, goals, he he equaled Ollie Watkins' goal output. Now, Solanke does have penalties and that we didn't even mention with Watkins is he but never took a pen oh, last season. That's just, true. With, with Luis gone, uh, does he, he's never been a great pen taker, but okay. So yeah. that, I guess I was also thinking like great shower thoughts, Ollie Watkins. He's got his shot at the number nine shirt with England after the summer and Harry Kane's power. There is kind of on the wane. Why would Ollie Watkins not want to just take pens for Villa, even though he's not very good at them. If he can get, any kind of good at pens for Villa, um, he can become a bit more talismanic. He can maybe take some. Well, he probably wouldn't take them for England anyway, but it would just really help cement his position with the England squad, I think, if he just scored more goals through penalties. Yeah, I mean, I guess he just has to make them, right? Yeah. It's, a, it's right. like It can be a real confidence. Yeah dampener if you take a bunch of pens and, and only make a I mean this happened with a uh, man city a couple of years ago I remember where it was like I think yeah. it was before Holland got there it was like Nobody they could not them. find anyone yeah they couldn't find anyone to take a pen and it was like Mares yeah. kept missing them and everybody else Bruno would miss him too yeah so the okay so let's move on to um Kai Havertz the other one that I'm sort of um I am slowly coming around on the on the Havertz thing and I uh, what you know what is really impressive about him is just how well he played once he got moved into that forward spot mm-hmm. right so he had a really really tough like almost kind of comically tough start to the season right it was Saka ultimately like gave him a pen right like just like Saka was giving away pens to everybody last season it was ridiculous and, generous fella. Know, too generous you know if you had him in fantasy but um you know he finally gave Havertz pen just to get him a goal right and um but then once he came on, he was incredibly impressive. He had nine goals and six assists in the final 14 matches of the season, right? So he averaged you know, averaged more than a return per match uh, throughout the final 14 matches of the season, which is uh, fantastic for you know what he was then, I think, a 7.5 million midfielder. And so now he's uh, an 8 million forward. Arteta loves him. Uh, I have to I, – I just can't – envision him not at least starting the season in that forward spot again, right? Because they, you know, Arsenal finished really strong. It was really just that kind of dip in December that, that, that cost them, right? Uh, the, the title. So, um, I don't know. Where are you on Havertz right now? Don't like him. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I guess like, that's, is it like that's you don't like the strong. cut of his, the cut of his jib. You don't like, um, his, uh, he's is it that strange, he's German? He's a strange character. And I have no, I have no quarrel with the German people, at least in the 21st century. Sure. Um, I just look at Arsenal and I think if there are improvements to make in that squad to take them to the next level, I think they need a stronger forward, a stronger striker. And I, I, Arteta clearly likes having that versatility that you were talking about with yeah. Hoberts. But I just think if anyone were to be replaced, it would be to have uh, more of a focal point up front. And then I think Havertz doesn't have a place in the team anymore. So he just as good as he is. And as many good moments as he had for Arsenal last season, he feels like an area of improvement for them. It's, I just think it's hard to evaluate him. Right. And maybe that's why I, I don't know that I'll start with him 
start with him this season either. Um, especially if I, if I hold on to, um, Odegaard, it feels like I've got two B plus a minus fantasy assets, right? Where you've got the one kind of a option in, in Saka. And, Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a real danger. If you look at your squad and it's like sacrifice, 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 and you're kind of doing all of it for, for balance. And then you're looking, you're like, I don't have a star in my team, right? Right. It's like, I have all these kind of, I have all the second best players. And I think that can be a risk sometimes when it comes to team building. So I, I, I don't know. I think, um, he's like a real, um, I, I just, it's hard for me to imagine him being like an average FPL player this season. I feel like he's either going to be incredible, right? Like Watkins level, like goals and assists, like massive returns, mm-hmm. more or less constantly, or he's going to be a colossal flop and like down 0.5 million in the first yeah. eight weeks. It feels like there's no in between. Like it's hard for me to imagine him having like a 14 goal, eight assists kind of season, right? It's like, <laughs> I feel like it's going to be more, he's more the extreme next Olivier Giroud. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, isn't it great that like, I, I always had kind of mixed feelings about him with Arsenal, but there's something about him just like still kicking around playing in LA. It's, it's like warms my heart. You know, it's like, uh, it's great to see. Seems like a good bloke, that guy. He does. He does seem like a good guy. All right. And then, um, so that's our tier two, right? So now we've, we, again, we've only talked about five forwards so far. We're already kind of, I think off what I would consider to be sort of the top, top fantasy assets. And now we're into, our mid-tier options, right? So these, again, if we're sticking with an NBA comparison, would be your solid starters, right? These guys might start every game for an 82-game season. A couple of them uh, will will crack the all-star team, right? But mm-hmm. uh, but uh, they're not going to be, you know, they're, they're not going to be all NBA first team, right? They're they're sort of like uh, they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna be kicking around. I don't know why I'm going all NBA. They might like wild card into the playoffs, perhaps, but that's yeah, pretty much it, the extent yeah, of it. it Exactly. Maybe they can lead their team to the in-season tournament victory or something like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So that's that's our mid-tier, right? There's just a lot of high-risk, high-reward players. Mm-hmm. You also have your kind of steady but unspectacular players. Uh, it's a real it's a real misc, right? And a real um, mi- mix. I don't even, mix. Yeah, mix. I said misc, but I meant uh, that's fine. we knew what you yeah, meant. Yeah, misc is an interesting word. Milan yeah. to Minsk. That's where we're <laughs> yeah, going. Exactly. Rochelle, Rochelle. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think uh, we got to kick things off here with Alvarez, uh, who is maybe the ultimate uh, kind of high risk, high reward asset. Uh, Seven million. Uh, so incredible price if he gets minutes. Uh, 11 goals, 11 assists last season. Made it all the way to the Copa America final, played big minutes. Um, the real worry here is. Less about him as an FPL asset, more about whether he's actually going to stick around uh, in yeah. the uh, in the Premier League. And there were some kind of worrying signs I saw over the last couple of weeks that it's kind of like, well, we're going to try to keep him, you know, like that sort of thing. <laughs> but he's oh so That's he's grim. so well, he's just he's so good, right? Yeah, like sure. he's such an amazing player, and he kind of lacks. He's not a. He just lacks a, a starting spot necessarily sure. for that yeah. squad, right? Yeah. And uh, and so I think it, it does create a pretty, you know, interesting dilemma. I mean, especially if you have Foden playing as well as he has, and um, you know, I, I don't know. It's I think it makes things really like you, you know out left or out right. Excuse me. I think that um, you know Bernardo Silva has been so spectacular. Like what they're doing works, right? And so it's hard to like kind of radically change it. So of course he'll get minutes, but whether that's enough for him to kind of spend his prime as a kind of yeah. Quasi backup. Uh, you know, I can see why he'd be pushing for a move. Yeah. Is it uh, a possibility that Erling Holland gets a giant publisher's clearinghouse size check from Saudi Arabia uh, mm. to go do that while he bides his time for like a Real Madrid contract? I and so. then uh, yeah. Julian Alvarez sticks around City to to own that position. And then he becomes just like in everybody's team uh yeah. that that that's the hopeful thing with alvarez the more likely thing i think is that holland sticks around uh and alvarez goes so um, but yeah i yeah. i think as it is he's not going to get the minutes we need as fantasy managers and he's he's won what he needs to win with city he's won the freaking world cup So he should go, I think City would honor him and let him go get paid somewhere. And he got 31 starts last season. Uh, You know, he... he, That was largely around the De Bruyne injury, though, I believe. 
So, and it's not like De Bruyne is back and going to play 90 every match. So there yeah. was that moment when De Bruyne wasn't playing and then Alvarez yeah. and Holland started together and that was working yeah. really well for yeah. fantasy. Yeah, I think it was, I think he had 20 plus starts to start the season, right? Uh-huh. It was like a really, it was a big number. And then kind of down the stretch, he was, he was in a little more yeah. of a kind of backup role. I think also maybe a couple of those, you know, there, there's some Champions League, um, starts in there as well. But this, I mean, this is always the problem with Man City, right? Is there's, there's the Champions League, there's, um, there's just a lot of, a lot of rotation. I mean, I, on, ultimately, I mean, I can't believe I'm saying this, Brian, but this is another argument against Holland, honestly, is, uh, is if they keep them both, um, then there's, I don't know, just 15 million for a, for a player like Holland who might miss a couple of starts, right? I mean, he'll probably still get minutes in those matches, but miss, might miss a couple starts for the Champions League is another risk there too. So I, I don't know, you know, I'm not, I don't, I, again, I have Holland in my squad right now, but I, I think it's, there are some like real doubts, like some yeah. real seeds of doubt that you can plant um, about whether you, you know, whether he's worth 15 million. Right. Okay. So we're, we're, we're generally down on Alvarez. Overall, yeah. Sad, sadly yeah. up on him as a, as a human being and player <laughs> down on him as a, a fantasy essay. <laughs> All right. So that brings us to Mateta. I talked earlier about him uh, being on the French Olympic team, which probably just takes him out of the running at the start of the season. Right. Uh, because I, I, would he go right from, I mean, the Olympics, I mean, they're going to run almost into the start of the season. Right. Like, so I think it's a, I mean, like it's it's not like Crystal Palace have so much squad depth that they can afford to just not play Mateta until game week four or something like that. It's you know, Edward's like extended... time. Yeah, it's yeah. Edward's time until November. Seven point five is a ridiculous price for him. That's too expensive. Pass. Yeah, I mean, he came on really hot at the end of the season. Sure. Sixteen, you know, sixteen yeah. goals, seven assists. Uh, but I I agree. I mean, especially when you can get Eze for seven million, right? It's like mm-hmm. you can get what I think is probably the better fantasy asset for even cheaper. Uh, that that's really, uh, makes it hard to have a uh, Mateta in that case. It kind of gets back to that second best, um, you know, point that I was talking about earlier. Um, again, we got to talk about him, Brandon, like it or not, but Chris Wood, uh, only 6 million, an incredible price, honestly, when you consider the remarkable consistency that you get for him, <laughs> like 14 goals last year, he has, uh, double digit goals in five different premier league seasons. Right. So like, you bring in Chris Wood every 2.5 games. You are going to get a goal. It's not a terrible return for a for a six million player. I guess I kind of wish he was 5.5. That'd be the one yes, <laughs> my same. one complaint. He's like a, almost a half million too expensive. But you know he's, he's he's not bad. It's he might even be more like a better option than Joe Pedro. Nottingham Forest though feels like uh, a very unstable situation. Perma is versus- perma instable. They're like the new Watford, right? There's like <laughs> yeah, a right. constant, yeah. constant like uh, change, and it, it somehow it works yeah. though. No, uh, Brighton just feels like a, a better run club. Uh, I, I'm putting my chips in with Joe Pedro here in this this competition. Okay, well we'll get to him in just a second. Okay. Uh, first though, we've got to talk about Nicholas Jackson, who had a really like he was one of the players, like if we did like a word cloud for last season, I suspect that Nicholas Jackson would have been one of the most talked about, uh, what 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 like what about the one of the most used proper names that we had in the yeah. pod last season because uh he was very highly owned at the start of the season when Nkuku was injured uh kind of thrust in the forward spot was not ready for it really i mean it was a kind of deer in the headlights yeah. start for him uh as the season wore on though right started to I, did he ever start to play completely better? I don't know. I, I don't ever feel like I saw a match where I was like, oh, Nicholas Jackson, this guy is just yeah. destroying the opposition. Well, like it never quite. There got are players that where, uh, yeah, maybe they're just thrust into the spotlight or whatever. They're not playing well and you can't quite put your finger on it. You're like, is yeah. it the system that doesn't really like compliment them? Is it their teammates? What's the problem here? Is it a mental thing with Nicholas Jackson at the start of last season? You could just watch the matches and you could just point at the screen and be like, yep. that's a thing he did wrong. That's a thing he did wrong. That's a thing he did wrong. <laughs> it was just plain, yep. plainly obvious um, the mistakes that he was making. So I think toward the end of the season, when the points started coming more consistently, I think it was just that he was less mistake prone so he kind of just sort of was balancing out to becoming just a a level player so where that leaves me in terms of liking him now as a fantasy asset or not i think this is like this and chelsea full stop are like hardcore 
must preseason investigate mode because yeah. they with Inkuku and uh, Jackson, they could be in direct competition yeah. for goals and assists and points, or maybe they will be a great Voltron force with Cole Palmer. And, Cuckoo, and we want all three of them. And Cuckoo is one like two goal, one assist preseason performance away from being like 50% owned, yeah. right? Like he's going to have some, he's yeah. going to play, you know, Vitesse in some preseason match and, yeah. you know, destroy him. And it's going to be a, uh, it's his FPL ownership is going to skyrocket. Um, all right. Well, we've got a couple other, um, well, he actually, no, that, that brings us to Jao Pedro, uh, who you've been, we've talked about already at the start of the pod. Um, when you look just at his, at his Premier League returns, um, there it's it's not bad. But when you factor in uh, the number of goals he scored across all competitions last season, because for whatever reason he the Zerbi seemed to trust him more in Europe or, or you know give him more starts. I mean, so he had nine goals and and three assists in in the Premier League last year. But when you include European goals, he had twenty goals uh, on the season. So he was kind of like a sneaky, <laughs> a, yeah, he was a <laughs> sneaky twenty goal scorer last. <laughs> season across <laughs> across all competitions which is okay. honestly pretty remarkable yeah. that's why it's always useful to pop into the transfer market page for these guys by yeah. the way especially anyone who played in europe because the numbers can look so different than what you see if you just look at like the, the you know the team page um you know the, the question is can he be trusted to start i think you know with ferguson out probably i mean i guess there's a possibility. I mean, they have a lot of great attacking midfielders, players who could play out of position, right? You could play Matoma as a forward. Uh, you could play. Why would you do uh, that? I'm Matoma just saying, no, you know, he's a great left winger, but I just mean like, there's okay. a lot of, there are a lot of players in that midfield who could kind of play in a kind of false nine sort of, sort of role, okay. right? Like, right. A, a, yeah. Yeah. I feel like you're, yeah, don't get too upset be, here. I, 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 I yeah, there's a word pre prom You're stuttering. You are upset. <laughs> <laughs> there's a word at work that I've started like uh, thinking more and more about pre plot pre problemy, where it's mm -hmm. just sort of like, is this not a thing? Why yeah. why are you trying to like make it a thing so you can solve it as a problem? Uh, well, but yeah, but this is what you have to anticipate future because we have a pool of you know roughly forty yeah. plus forwards that that are. Yeah. That are possibilities for our team. So I think I think it's uh it behooves us to fair. interrogate fair, every fair, fair. every every option. Well, why, else guy, are, why else yeah. are we here? Yeah, I Another, just feel like with with yeah. with Joe Pedro, yeah. the the sort of like I don't know if it qualifies as Occam's razor, but just like mm -hmm. the easiest solution here is just for whoever's leading the charge on Brighton is just put him in the number nine. And yeah. unless you sign somebody else, that's probably as good as it gets until Evan Ferguson is healthy and yeah. is the baller that he was before, which may not happen for another season, honestly. I, the other thing is I don't really love the start for Brighton. Uh, yeah. Away to Everton, home to Man United, away to Arsenal in the first three. It gets, it gets better after that. Um, the guy I'm really worried about, the Brandon, is his competition. Uh, Mark O'Mahony. Is uh, is is on the uh, uh, the Brighton uh, FPL page? Is that O apostrophe Mahoney? Yeah, O apostrophe Mahoney. <laughs> Mark Mark O Mahoney is. Uh, it's not is, Marco. He's not like a. It's not. It's, Latin he's not like a person. Croatian. Uh, no, he is Mark Space O apostrophe Mahoney okay. is uh, his competition. So uh, yeah, Mark O Mahoney. He could be your next. Uh, your, he's only four point five million, Brandon. So uh, I'll make a prediction, which is that I will give you a crisp. Canadian dollar. If, uh, if you have, if you have uh, Jao Pedro at the start of the season, I will, okay. I will put a dollar in the mail and I'll send it to you and uh, you can, you can just own that. That's not even a bet. You don't have to give me a dollar. I will just send you a dollar. If you have, I'll have to go to get it converted somewhere. I mean, where sure. does one even find a Canadian dollar? I used to, when growing up in Michigan, I used to have Canadian coins in my pocket all the time. If I, sure. <laughs> if I had a pocket full of change, at least two of those coins were, were Canadian. I was walking by a hot dog stand uh, here in Toronto the other day, and I heard somebody talking to the guy in the, in the cart saying, asking if he accepted U.S. cash. And he was like, sure, it's no problem. It's not, it's yeah. not a big deal. Um, I will send you a dollar equally if you have as a in your game week one spot. <laughs> oh, that's good all right this is a good challenge uh and we're gonna we're gonna hold ourselves to this too well, we've got to uh, somebody will yeah, yeah somebody will all right uh now we move on to what i call the high risk high reward tier brandon i've got three players here i think we can take them all at once uh you have darwin seven seven point five million eleven goals eleven assists last season you have cody gakpo 
whose returns are really nothing to write home about. He had um, uh, eight goals and five assists in the Premier League last season. Wasn't really ever a kind of steady starter, but new manager uh, had a you know was was I thought he was terrific for the Netherlands, arguably their best player. Um, uh, not even arguably, I think he was clearly the best player in the uh, in the Euros. Um, uh, so I think that he has a real shot uh, at being a, an interesting fantasy asset this season. Again, seven point five million, great price. So uh, you know, I wonder if there's Liverpool is going to have some really strong run. Um, and in fact, their start is pretty good. And so I think that yeah. as as we get closer to the season, I just can't have anybody in my current squad because I don't really know who I'm supposed to put there. Right? Yeah. Like outside of Salah, the kind of ever consistent option. My prediction for Arnie Slot is under him, one of these two players, and not both, will have a breakout season. It's either yeah. going to be Darwin Nunez or Cody Gakpo. I don't know. I saw Darwin uh, play for Uruguay in the Copa. I feel like I watched most of Uruguay's Copa. It's the same old dude. I mean, he can't, he just can't finish. It's, it's, yeah. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Like, I, I don't, I honestly don't understand it. It's like mm-hmm. he just, uh, it's, I guess it's just, you know, I don't know. It's like, uh, I'm not sure it's ever going to get that much better. So we have, we're getting to the point where we have enough evidence. Yes. Yeah, exactly. The, the underlines will always be fantastic for him. The yeah. results are, I mean, 11, 11 and 11 is not bad. I don't want to completely, you know, diminish, uh, his returns, but it's, it's, again, it's interesting when you look at point per game average, Right. I think that that does tell a, a different story. Right. So the, the average for Darwin is he averaged three point seven points per game. Now, granted, some of that is because he had some sub appearances, although I'm not sure how much like we should use it as a caveat, because that kind of means he has a tendency to lose managers trust, <laughs> which which means that he comes <laughs> yeah. off the bench more often. But that points per game average is worse than basically any other forward that you would consider right in the top. Like yep, yep. Uh, you have to go you know, 10, 10 plus spots down to find any forward that has a, a you know, a worse. Nico Jackson blew him now. away with 4.1. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, you know, so I think that's, that, that does make things, I think a little tricky for him. And then yeah, I think the other one is uh, Richarlison who, um, you know, you and I are, have never been, massive, massive Richarlison fans. There's a lot of data on him as well, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's sort of, again, it's it's a little bit like like the Darwin thing, but a full season, uh, it's like a mini Kai Havertz sort of situation, right? Where it's like a, got his confidence, starts, started to play better. He He's, you know, in, in some ways he's a very complete player. I mean, he can do a lot of different things, right? But it's mm-hmm. just sort of, He's, he's, you know, he's, he's kind of a, he's also a ridiculous player. I mean, he's, you know, he's, <laughs> he's completely ridiculous. Yes. He's yes. He's completely ridiculous. Fun to watch in, in many ways, but, um, you yeah. know, but, but 11 goals, four assists, uh, again, a strong points, you know, average 4.4, you know, points, points per game, which is, you know, honestly pretty, pretty strong considering uh, how much he was kind of in and out of that squad last season. So, um, I think that there is some potential with Darwin still that could be tempted into. Um, I think that, um, and, uh, you know, it clearly likes a, a, you know, an attacking style of play, uh, it made, mm-hmm. made Spurs one of the most fun teams to watch last year. It didn't feel like where Charleston fully settled in for a good long time, but started to maybe get there as the season went on. So I, I feel don't know. Like he I, had a blip yeah. where he did start to settle in and then. <laughs> That whole yeah. Then, then it regressed. Yeah. Um, so it's I, almost like if he was going to find that, like, I mean, you can see why he gets minutes for Brazil. For example, it's like it's just like it, it feels like he's never going to get to God tier. You know, he's just always mm-hmm. going to be kind of he's always going to get you between like eight and fourteen goals, and that's just sort of like that's the best he can kind of do, right? As, yes. a, as, a, as a forward, he's the dime store Alvaro Morata. Yeah. <laughs> um, I like that. I don't, I don't, you know, I have to interrogate. I don't even know, but I like it. I like the way it sounds. Uh, all right. So we have, um, another section here, Brandon, we're now moving on to tier four, which is, uh, I guess what, I'm just calling these, I mean, there's no, well, yeah, uh, forwards from promoted clubs in new premier league transfers. Right. So, uh, they don't quite fit into the other tiers of people because their numbers come from, um, either outside the premier league. Well, I, I, yeah, either, either out either from the championship or from outside, um, England. Um, and so we've got, uh, Southampton, Ipswich and Leicester as the three promoted clubs. We'll talk more about them as the season. So we get closer to the season. Um, the one player, by the way, that really stood out for me on Ipswich was, um, uh, this guy, Leaf Davis. Are you familiar with Leaf Davis? Who, mm, tell me um, everything. 
he's a left back who scored, who had 18 assists for Ipswich last season. He led, <laughs> he led the squad many. in assists. 18 <laughs> assists. Uh, he is available at 4.5 million for Ipswich. I really want to find a way to get Leaf Davis into my uh, spot. So yeah, so we'll talk more about Leaf Davis as we get closer to, uh, to the start of the season. Um, but uh, yeah, when it comes to the uh, promoted clubs, we've got uh, Southampton, uh, you've got Adam Armstrong, who uh, uh, has a couple of years in the Premier League, really didn't do anything, right? But And so we kind of see these yo-yo players, right, who sort of don't do much in the Premier League, go down to the championship. Who is the... I'm, I'm struggling to remember his name. He played for Norwich and then he moved to Aston Villa. Uh, Emmy Buendia, right? Buendia okay. was kind of the the <laughs> ultimate at this. Uh, Dwight Gale had some of this as well. Uh, so Armstrong, though, I mean, just unquestionably an excellent season, right? I mean, 21 goals and 13 assists. That's that's fantastic no matter what league you're in. Um, has bad haircut, you know. I'm not going to necessarily hold that against him, but uh, it has to be. hairlines do terrible things It to has people. to be, yeah, it has to be said. Um they do have DC and opening fixtures. It's a nice run of fixtures. But once you get past the Newcastle match uh, to kick things off in game week one, it's uh, they have Forest away, uh, Manyat at home, and Ipswich at home uh, in three of their next four matches. So if you were going with kind of like a five across the middle, rotating third forward or four defenders, you know, if you're going big at the back, if you were going to basically rotate your your bench a little bit, then I think you could at least make an argument for Armstrong based almost solely on the fixtures, um, mm-hmm. right? That like a couple home matches for Southampton, they're back in the Premier League, the crowd should be fired up. Maybe there's something there, right? And uh, I think part of what I want to do in this this very pod is just kind of try to make a positive case for some of these players, right? <laughs> and so I think that, that would yeah. be the case for for Armstrong. Uh, when it comes to Ipswich, is really not um, a lot. They um, actually, they're, they're the highest scoring team in the championship last season. Um, I think they were actually the highest scoring team like for several seasons. Like they were really, they, they really did a fantastic job. Um, but there's no kind of one standout forward pick, unfortunately. It was, the goals were really spread out across the squad. They got a couple of promoted players, or I mean, a couple of um, loan players as well. Uh, the one to watch would be, uh, you know, could he be a mini Cole Palmer, Brandon, uh, which is uh, Liam Delaney. Uh, mm-hmm. 21 year old former Man United Academy player uh, had eight goals and 31 appearances for Hull City last year. But again, very, very young player, uh, you know, has a lot of potential. Um, so I think he, at 5.5 million, it's, it's, he is completely dead on arrival uh, yeah. to start the season. But yeah, the uh, toss him in your, you know, player to watch pile. Yeah. Ipswich probably go the way of Luton Town where they, they're the promoted team that has the most identifiable um, sort of like team play style, possession-based attack. Yeah, yeah I, exactly. That's the word I was going for. Yeah. And uh, that often results in like flights of, of fancy for fantasy managers where you're like, ooh, these, these guys look fun. They look good. They can score a goal here or there. And it, will it pan out? It's really hard to yeah. say. And then you look at Southampton, probably – more likely the team to sort of like try to consolidate and like we've yeah. got to hold on to 17th yeah. uh, through sheer defensive willpower. It's a Less- very similar mm-hmm. team to the team that went down at the moment. Like it mm-hmm. does not feel like things have radically changed. Yeah, where's Che Adams on yeah. this, uh, this sheet you've got here? My boy yeah. Che. I think he's, I think he might be classified as a midfielder now. No. Uh, let me, let me, let me double check <laughs> that. I feel like that might be the case uh where is, is adam because he because he was like playing out on the on on the wing uh, i don't know is d- does he even play for southampton anymore <laughs> i've not seen maybe, him maybe his I'm contract not. ran out this is very odd yeah they clearly need to update some of the uh the, the player profiles on the fantasy side for these teams yeah i am i am just straight up i, I maybe i'm just missing it because we're we're potting and sometimes like my brain doesn't doesn't i'm not seeing him on the fpl side either yeah i'm not seeing him either so shea adams uh i mean he's probably gonna come in at what, 13 14 million i mean he's probably gonna probably gonna be after uh holland <laughs> the most no it's there's yeah at the moment there's a lot of um a lot of even lalana they've added lalana from brighton that's an interesting uh move so uh, looks um, like the, the internet yeah. tells me he might be going to torino in italy uh, so shea adams yeah 
Well, the Scots love Torino, Brandon. And so, yeah, I can see, I can see him going there. Timeshares are there ridiculous for the Scots. Yeah, exactly. exactly. All right. So uh, then we then, you know, we we round things out with Lester. Uh, You have uh, our old friend, Jaime Vardy, uh, 20 goals and two assists, a classic Vardy return uh, in 37 matches for Lester last season. Uh, He's 37 years old uh, and he looked cooked by the end of the last Premier League season. He looked completely <laughs> spent. Um, I really don't like see any, there's, I can't imagine having Vardy, um, at least like maybe for a double game week or an incredible run of fixtures or something like that. But I think I love Vardy, like genuinely, like it's one of my, sure. it's one of the all time, one of the Premier League's all time great stories. And, and a, and a player, like I was talking about Isak earlier, a player who was, Vardy is just incredibly fun to watch, right? Everybody loves Jimmy yes. Vardy, but uh, I do not see myself um, having Vardy uh, this season, sadly. There's there's no conceivable way in which Lester build a strategy around starting Jamie Vardy. So he's going to be, yeah. you know, the spirit in the locker room. Come on for some sub appearances. This is not a good fantasy solution for us, unfortunately. But yeah. yes, I kind of will hold out secret hope that at some point in the midpoint or latter in the season, there will be some sort of in, injury or whatever that allows Jamie Vardy a guaranteed run. Yeah. And it'll make sense for us to all get him in for a couple of weeks. Yeah. And no one else is really like DACA. I, I really thought he had a lot of potential, but he's, he still hasn't really come on. didn't really do much. And I just feel like if you're, if you're only scoring, if you're scoring single digit levels of goals in the premier league, or, I mean, in the championship, you're just, completely yeah. the championship is like it's like first of all it's like 45 matches right or whatever yeah. it is 46 and so it's that alone makes it like the numbers should be like the dutch league right like you, you got to be banging <laughs> in like 15 plus for us to even be you know thinking about you going into your premier league season um so yeah I, I don't really see it and then a couple of transfers i'm sure we'll see more as the season as the season gets closer uh you have uh, joshua's uh Zerksy, the um the dutch player who uh just just signed for man united i think it was just last week uh that that finally wrapped didn't really get a ton of minutes for the dutch i think he got his um I think it might have been his debut uh, in the quarterfinal match uh, for for the Dutch, and so um, you know, long way to um, I, you know, not a not a not anyone that I would consider um, at the start of the season. Xerxes I, sounds too much like the the final boss in a, in a Ghostbusters movie. Yeah, um, well, there, there's also Xerxes, the like great like Persian ruler, right? Or is there Xerxes? Isn't that like? Isn't that he, sounds uh, of, that yeah. sounds right. Isn't sounds Xerxes plausible. a Persian? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I haven't seen 300 in a while, but I think. Uh, um, <laughs> well, let's do a yeah. watch along. Yeah. Yeah. Always cheating yeah. 300 watch along. <laughs> yeah. 12 goals and seven assists and 37 appearances for Bologna last season. Uh, the the one that I think is a little more intriguing, especially if Ivan Tony moves, uh, is uh, Tiago uh, Igor Tiago, uh, Brazilian forward that Brentford signed. Um, one of the reasons I'm excited about it is because I just really trust Brentford to make smart signings. Like they're just not the kind of club that I like. You know, if they're going to spend thirty million pounds on a player, I just assume that they know what they're doing. Right. And that they probably, it's probably a, like a smart spend because uh, they're just so good at buying and selling, uh, top players. And so I think, uh, he's one to watch, not a lot to kind of go on. He was in club Bruges last season. I uh, was only, it's only like, you know, it's honestly, it's, it's a kind of classic story though. Um, a lot of players who are like are talented, uh, in, in a place like club Bruges, you know, I feel like Brighton in general are the, the Brighton loves that Belgian pipeline, you know, mm-hmm. but, uh, but he had 18 goals and 34 matches there. So, you know, an impressive rate of return. Um, not one again that is a game week one option, uh, although Brentford do have a nice start to the season. Um, it'll be interesting. We'll see how he looks in preseason. But at $6 million, it's a good enabler price. So Yeah, it rules consider. out Mape for anybody who wants to have a little fun there. And yeah. Uh, so and, and Wiss is too unreliable, right? right. That's, yeah. All right. So that's that's your forward. I'm sure like we could, you know, honestly, we could do like three hours. There's, like, there's plenty we didn't talk about, but just that, that I wanted to give you a range, Brandon, of of options Thank you, uh, to, to think about, to consider. Um, so let's wrap our forward talk there. Let's end things though, Brandon, with a little listener mailbag. Hmm. You ready for this? I got yeah. I got question questions three for you, Brandon, to Ooh. consider. Yes. Uh, so Shiv says, uh, "Who are the auto picks for you as things stand right now?" So, who in your squad, Brandon, is would you consider to be a lock going into game week one? Do you have a one, two, three players that are that are locks? 
Certainly Cole Palmer. Uh, I think uh, in the spirit of this episode, you know, I could see somehow getting tempted to go Watkins over Isak, but the way we're definitely feeling right now is super pro Isak. Mm-hmm. So I feel like Cole Palmer and Isak are mortal locks. The, the thing with like other locks across teams is with Arsenal defense, you, you know, it's it's going to be a toss up between Saliba and Gabrielle. I don't think you you could make a strong case for one over the other. You, you could try anyway. Maybe Guardiol is yeah. the third. Guardiol feels like a, a big one for me as well. To be honest, I, Watkins it would be the the lock for me. Um, mm-hmm. I just feel really good about him. The only question would be whether because England made the finals of the Euros that there's some doubt about him starting in game week one, which I suppose. There's a possibility. I don't see it as a super strong possibility, but um, that's out there. Sure. Uh, yep. I think he starts. I, I think so, too. Uh, Glenn says, uh, I'm setting the line at 3.5 on the over-under this season and how many free transfers out of a maximum of five that either AC, Brandon, or that, well, I don't know why I'm saying our Discord handles, that either <laughs> Josh or Brandon managed to roll before succumbing. What say you? So in case you missed our last week pod uh, or our, our one from midweek when the game launched, a big change that's happened going into this season is that you can now keep up to five transfers. And even if you wild card, you get to hold on to your transfers, right? So if you have two or three transfers in your, you know, um, in your bank available to you and you wild card, when you come out of the wild card, you will still have those three, fr- th- those three transfers. That's incredibly interesting in terms of the kind of strategic possibilities it opens up and the things you could possibly do on a wild card, players you might just have for one or two weeks because it's very easy to sort of transfer them out after that, right? Sometimes you have players who have, you know, one spectacular game, like a home match versus a promoted squad, followed by three terrible matches to follow. And you're kind of mm-hmm. like, well, I don't really want them because I want to burn a transfer to, to take them out, you know, after the fixture run. So, um, but with all that said, uh, I think I will probably, I think the, I would take the under on 3.5 for me. I can't see myself ever getting to four transfers held <laughs> and I would bet the house on you <laughs> going over 3.5 and having four transfers, probably most of the season. Honestly, I could see, uh, that's, that's, that's where I see. What do you think? Am I, am I right about this? I mean, what what greater feeling than knowing there's always enough money in the checking account so that mm-hmm. those auto pay bills, you're just like, I don't even have to think about that. That's true. So That's true. you get a strong transfer bank going and then you never have to worry, will I have enough transfers going into next game week? Um, there's some truth yeah, there. Some I'll hard get to truth four. there, Brandon. I'll get to four for sure. Okay. Uh, I think you will too. Um, Amar B, I like this this one to end on, Brandon. Amar B says, my seven-year-old's been talking nonstop about the game for weeks. Uh, I registered an account and a team for him, and it's going to be his first time playing the game. Yeah. Any tips on how to make fantasy fun for the young ones? Hmm. Well, you're the one with a kid. I mm-hmm. am without kid. So... Yeah. I don't know. What do you think? Would you ever get your kid involved in fantasy? Is that something that would be fun for you guys to collaborate on? Yeah, I, th- I think eventually. I mean, there are a lot of um, a lot of people. I, I, we talked to many people, uh, even people that we know in person, right? Brian. Um, st- st- oh, my gosh. I'm going to mispronounce his last name. Stel- Stelwe, the um, our friend from uh, the Pennsylvania. Stwal- uh, Stwally. Yeah. Stwally. Excuse yeah. me. Yeah. From the from the. Um, Philadelphia area. Uh, he's come to meetups with, with his, you know, with his son before. Yeah. And, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Brian, but your kid seems cooler than you. So <laughs> uh, we're really glad that he tagged along. Yeah. But we, uh, there's a lot, I mean, a lot of people play uh, with their kids. I, my seven year old is, is at the moment too competitive and um, I can't, like they can't deal with losing at all. And I so the where idea they get that from, yeah, I know, I know it's, it's, and it's horrible because I don't feel like I've imparted it to Quinn, but somehow it's <laughs> happened anyway. Uh-huh. Um, and so I, I wouldn't be quite ready for it, but yeah, I think, I mean, I was taking sports pretty seriously by the time I was, you know, eight, nine, 10, like, uh, yeah. you know, for me it was, it was, you know, they didn't really have fantasy when, when we were kids. And so it was, I was like a baseball card person, you know, mm-hmm. and that's sort of, um, you know, but like some way to like, I mean, fantasy is great because, you know, especially like if you're, if you're interested in the premier, like this is one of the reasons you, when I got into fantasy, like, you know, whatever it was yeah. 14 years ago is, you know, we sort of, uh, we just wanted to be, um, more kind of knowledgeable at the premier league. And, and then, 
you, you get hooked on the game, but part yeah. of the fun of it is that you start to learn the names of every player and you learn more about leagues and yeah. you learn so, more about Europe yeah. and England, right? There's a lot that comes with it. To that point, I wonder if the way to make it fun for a young first timer is to make it more about that process as opposed to the outcome. So yeah. maybe what Amar can do with his son is they've got a every Friday morning at breakfast, they sit down and look at their teams together and yeah. talk about what they're going to do. And yeah. then it, it's not necessarily about, oh, we're going to watch the teams and follow our scores over the course of the weekend. Because yeah. that's what generates stress and competitiveness. Maybe it's more about the setting of the team and uh, mm -hmm. making that the, the fun. Yeah. Exciting. Maybe you set up a head to head with them and you mm -hmm. are um, like you play um, like, so they don't have like a, a major, like, you know, maybe it wouldn't be fun if they're in some 20 person yeah. mini league and right. they're they're 20th after three weeks or, yeah. but if it's the, like a head to head, then each week it's sort of um, the likelihood of, the, of your kid getting lucky uh, week to week and, and exactly. really getting one over on you is higher there. Yeah. You and I have seen this when we've done our head to heads with each other, right? It's right. sort of, it doesn't matter how well one of the other person's doing you, you end up roughly 55%, you know, you, you, yeah. no one, no one ever just kind of runs the table in a head to head yeah. league, right? Cause you know, mm -hmm. it's sort of like that, like beat the average thing that we talked about before, where you just, a lot of times average, you're just going to be below average, right? Like, so, like yeah. you're some, some, um, uh, untemplate players are gonna, are gonna go off. It's gonna happen mm -hmm. one, one week at least. Yeah. But I think, um, I, I think I would try not to, um, uh, over manage them either. At least if my kids, any indication, like, they just hate when I look over their shoulder, you know, for any, for anything or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so I think, I think I just let them pick whoever they want. Don't try to coach them out of it. You know, if they want to have their three players from Man United, cause they're a Man United supporter, then fine. Find three that, if they want yeah, O'Mahony, if they want O'Mahony, you know, it's, and who doesn't, I want O'Mahony in my, my squad. Uh, yeah. I hope if I, if I, you know, if my season's done by game week 38, that's my final transfer is O'Mahony is coming in. <laughs> Um, so I think that's a good place to end on here, Brandon. Thanks everyone for listening. We'll be back with another pod, uh, in a few days time, but, uh, I got a long way to go until, uh, until the season starts. So lots of time to think things through. I think we're going to start to get some, in fact, I know that we are going to start to get some preseason matches over the next few days. So, uh, it's a good chance to do a little scouting, not take them ever too seriously, because I think once you start to, yeah. Uh, over, you can overdo it with, uh, with, um, taking, you know, taking too much out of preseason friendlies, but, uh, it can be instructive, for, you know, none, nonetheless. Oh, for sure. And, uh, don't forget everything that we, we instructed you upon at the, the start of the episode, namely for 50% off a membership at fantasy football hub, go to fantasy football hub.co.uk slash always to get uh, that half off discount. And if you like what you hear, you want to say thanks and you want to join in and all the fun in the Always Cheating community, hang out with us at patreon.com slash always cheating, as Josh mentioned at the top. We've got one ad feed to rule them all. If you're a Patreon supporter, you get all the episodes in one place ad free, including that extra bonus podcast it happens every Thursday, starting at the start of the season, where we're closer to the game week deadline, our final thoughts on our own team lineups and all of your rate my teams, et cetera. And patreon.com slash always cheating. Josh, you want to read uh, the most important tier for our That's Patreon right. subscribership, the producers. We need to thank them. All right. Thank you to Mike DiPietro, Trevor Ingerson, our buddy Chris Howell, Babas Kuhn, James Holland, Dave Wagner Lodal, Nick Wright. You know, by the way, it's been so long since we've had Babas Kuhn on here, Brendan. I don't even remember who that is. Like, I can't remember. We <laughs> renamed somebody that at their request, and I honestly don't even remember. They they might not they might not have been a producer for like five years. And that's just uh uh James James Holland, Dave Wagner Lodal, Nick Wright, Lazarus Yanos, Jesse Halstead. Uh, by the way, our friend Dave Wagner Lodal finally back, I believe, uh, from yeah. uh, his long his long trip over from Denmark. Uh, yeah, yeah, Denmark. Uh, Jesse Halstead, Shalin F. Kadakia, Terrence O'Donnell, Heath Cram, Thomas Tisloff, Noah and Louise. They're actually in Denmark too. I should I should have connected them actually, Brandon. They were there at the same time. Wow. Uh, Travis Grant, Linus Vinnerstrom, Bruce Kerr. Brian Chin, Blair Jacobson, Todd Byerly, Andy Portlock, at FPL Merch, Kerry Swanson, Jefferson Turner, Buffalo Wild Mings, Dan Parsons, James C., Matthew Skinner, Fred Jacobson, Brennan, Daniel Hart, Lolly. So many producers, Brandon. It's really wonderful to see it them is. all. Love Francis it. Moore, Sam Shower, Caleb Robbie, Vulgar Paulson Kruger, Alex Holcomb, James Keeley, The Saint, Bob Fox, Craig Jackson, 
Ben Coombs, Eric Kite, Gareth H., Rune Sandberg, Brian Clark, and James Murray Wood. Oh, and Ron Frosk, our newest uh, producer patron as of a couple days ago. So if you would like to support the podcast, become a patron at any pledge tier. Uh, any tier gets you access to the Discord. And then our kind of uh, featured tier, the uh, Sorloff tier, is the one that gets you uh, access to the bonus podcast each week. Go to patreon.com slash alwayscheating. You can find all this information at more at alwayscheating.com. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Spotify, YouTube, at all. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye, guys. I'm Xavier Worthy, wide receiver for the NFL. Speeding. It's a rush on the field, in the zone, where it matters. As an athlete, I push my limits to win. But when I get behind the wheel, I know the importance of slowing down for safety. Because speeding is illegal. It endangers you, your loved ones, and everyone else on the road. Did you know speeding accounts for more than one quarter of all traffic-related fatalities nationwide? Just like we need to focus to score touchdowns and win games, we need to be in the zone to stay safe on the road. Speed limits are in place to protect everyone. No matter what the speed limit is, anything over is not only illegal, but dangerous. Like athletes, drivers must stay alert and present because there is no reward for speeding. Nothing is safe about it. Driving over the speed limit might seem like the quicker option, but speeding catches up with you. Stay focused. In a split second, everything can change. Paid for by Nitsa.